Wow. Yeah. I wish I had three days. It would take me that long at least to tell the full story, the whole story. Um, you may be seated, please. Where do I begin? This story begins over 50 years ago when somehow I convinced this amazing woman that you're going to see pictures of to fall in love with me. I'm not quite sure how I did it. I must have been incredibly charming. <laughs> have you got the pictures, guys? Please. Thank you, You're welcome. Thank you. I'm going to wait for the pictures. So anyway, uh, we'll wait, and then I'll stop as soon as they get them up. Are they going to get them up? Okay. Um, if it was just me, I would skip it, but it's too important for her. Uh, That was one of them. I cannot imagine the stress that's going on in that control room right now. I'm just as cool as I can be, but back there, there we go. That picture was actually taken on the day that we began two services. Come on, guys, we're better than this. There we go. That was a big day in our life. Another big day. No one liked a party like Rochelle Neiman. That may be my favorite picture. So, I want to thank all of you for being here tonight. I cannot tell you how much it means to me, and it means more to me than you can imagine, for me to be up here tonight and to feel your love and your support. This book, as Shannon said, well, if you don't mind, I'll read the part of the back cover. Ten years after the passing of his wife, Rochelle Charles Neiman, Senior pastor and founder of one of the largest churches in the nation has taken pen to paper for the first time ever to tell the story of how he discovered hope, peace, and restoration in the middle of darkness. His journey towards recovery challenges every reader at the crossroads of an ending and a new beginning to find a new perspective when life doesn't play along. This book will challenge you to discover the courage, the strength, and the grit to gather yourself, get back up, and run full force towards the life of restoration and purpose. It took me 10 years to write it. As Shannon said, I sat down on several occasions to write it, wrote a part of it, had it done, had a contract with the publishing company to publish it and send it out. And I walked in to Shannon and Jared one day. I said, I can't do this. I can't do it. I've just now gotten to the point to where I can think about it and not break down. I can't do it. I can't go around the country and talk about this anymore. So I laid it down. And I really thought that it would never happen. So tonight I want to thank Shannon, Jared, and Carla for your belief in my story and the need for this little 140-page book. So why the book? What's the point? Why, why write a book about such a difficult time in my life and our family's life and in the life of our church? 
Why write a book? Because sometimes, as you've heard tonight, life just doesn't play along. Can anybody say amen to that statement? It doesn't play along. Sometimes you get what ESPN calls a bad beat. Doesn't work. Let me give you some examples. Someone you loved with all your heart is taken from you or leaves you. Someone you trusted betrayed you. Someone who should have protected you harmed you. You were abused. You were lied to or lied about. Maybe the thief of John 10.10 10, where Jesus gives this incredible revelation to us that is the thief that comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Not God, not Jesus, not the Holy Spirit. The thief comes. And maybe the thief got through and stole, killed, and destroyed in your life. I can say to you tonight that it has all happened to me and to many of you. So then the question comes, what are you going to do? What are you going to do when life doesn't play along? What are you going to do when you're abused, taken advantage of, betrayed, lied to, lied about? When someone that you hooked your hopes and dreams to is no longer there. Someone that you had these great plans with is taken from you or decides to leave you. What are you going to do? I say that you have two options. You can quit. No one will fault you. I'm not going to judge you. To be honest with you, there were times when I was moving from darkness to light. There were times when I thought about quitting. I'll be frank with you tonight. I grieved. I cried more than I thought was humanly possible. I stayed up entire nights, never went to sleep, grieving, crying, regretting, asking God to somehow tell Rochelle how sorry I was. Sorry for what, Charles? Because somehow in my darkness, I felt that I had failed her, that somehow I was supposed to protect her from ovarian cancer. Mentally, I know that's not reasonable. It's ridiculous. But as a man, as a husband, I felt that was my responsibility. I'm old fashioned that way. And I fought this ongoing battle with regret. I thought about quitting. I thought about it. I felt like at times, and I write about this all a lot in the book, I thought a lot, several times, many times, that I was losing my mind. Some of you know what I'm talking about. I thought I was losing my mind. I would be in my car driving somewhere and would have to pull over into a parking lot somewhere because I couldn't remember where I was driving to. I didn't know where I was going. Happened to me a lot of times. I would wake up in the middle of the night with panic attacks. Felt like an elephant was sitting on my chest and there wasn't enough air in my bedroom for me to breathe. 
I remember one time I pulled up to my security gate at the housing area I lived in and I couldn't remember the code to get in. I sat there hoping somebody would pull up and I could pull around and follow them in. Nobody pulled up and eventually I called Jared and said, I'm sitting here at the gate and I can't remember the code. And he gave it to me and I punched it in. And That day I pulled in and pulled up my driveway and didn't even pull into the garage. I just pulled my car up and opened the door and got out of the door and I walked over to the ravine that was behind my house and I stood there and I, sharing this with you because I think some of you have been there, you know somebody that's there and I stood there at the edge of that ravine and I said to God, I said, if this is my future, if this is my future, if I'm going to lose my ability to remember and to think and to function, then right here, right now, I think you owe me this. You need to take me to heaven. Because I refuse to live this way. If this is my future, you need to take me to heaven right now. And I just stood there and waited. I did. Obviously, he didn't take me. So what that said to me, what that said to me was, then you still have a hope and a future for me. But I also under, so let me go back to my point that you can quit. I'm not going to judge you. As I said, I thought about quitting. What's important, though, is what my pastor, Tommy Barnett, called me years ago. It's all right to think about quitting. Just don't quit. It's all right to think about it. Tommy writes his resignation letter every Sunday night. That's what he told me. Writes his resignation letter every Sunday night. Puts it in his jacket pocket on his way to, church, to the office on Monday so he can resign. Because he, he thinks in his mind he did such a lousy job on Sunday. He's going to drive in and turn in his resignation letter. And before he stop, goes, he stops and gets him a Vente coffee. And he said, that coffee has kept him in the ministry <laughs> all these years. Some of you know what I'm talking about, right? So he said, it's all right to think about quitting. You just don't quit. That's nice. That's a cute thing to say. That's good preacher stuff. But when you live in it, it's a whole different game. Could I hear a good amen? amen? So I said, I felt like I was losing my mind. I was filled with so much regret. I've had people ask me recently, Pastor, what was the biggest struggle you had with me? It was regret. It was regret. And I've learned a great lesson about regret. You can't win the battle with it. You can't win it. You cannot win the battle with regret. Can I tell you why? Because you can't change anything that you're regretting. Because everything you're regretting is in the past and you can't do anything about it. It's back there. And no matter how much you add it, it comes up with the wrong number. Does anybody know what I'm talking about tonight? And that was the biggest battle for me. I regretted not what we had. I regretted what we weren't going to have. I regretted that my grandchildren would never know this incredible woman. A woman that all she ever talked about for years and years and years was, was her becoming a grandmother. I used to say to her, you know, I'm going to become a grandfather too. Yeah, well. <laughs> it's just like it didn't register. It was going to all be about her, and it would have all been about her, I promise you that. <laughs> all right? I couldn't... I couldn't sleep. I would go days and not sleep because of fear and anxiety and regret. Fear of the future. Fear of being alone. Fear of becoming a burden to my children. Fear of
that somehow I let her down. There were times a lot of you were here. You were here in service with me when I would break down in public, standing on this great stage with this tremendous responsibility on my life. I would just break down. I would stand up here and weep. It seemed to me like forever. I'm sure it was just a few moments. So then I say all that to you tonight to bring us to this question, can we respond when life doesn't play along? Can we respond? I'm going to say yes, but I'm going to add this to it. We must. Amen. You must respond. You must respond. Hear me. That darkness is not going to leave you because you cry. That fear is not going to let go because you feel sorry for yourself. The devil is not going to call the dogs off because you don't want to get out of bed. You must and can respond. There is a response to you for you in Scripture. I said in the video before we began tonight that I told a story, and I'll just touch on it again now. I told the story about that morning I was at church, Sunday morning, December the 30th. I came into the Saturday night service on Saturday night, and I went back home that night, and I could tell Rochelle was not doing well. It was her birthday. And she wasn't doing well, but she had so much fun that day. And, and uh, she wanted to know all about the service and how it went. And I told her about it. And I decided while I was talking to her that I wasn't going to come and do the Sunday services. And I guess she sensed it. And she looked at me and she said, now you're going to church tomorrow. And I said, no. I'm going to stay here with you. And she said, no, you're going to church tomorrow. She said, you've been out a lot. The church loves you. They need to see you. You're their pastor. You need to be there. And you know, when you're married to somebody, as long as I was with Rochelle, there's certain things, you know, that's just not worth arguing over <laughs> because there's not going to be an argument. It's already settled. Can I get a witness on that, on that, right? And that was settled. So I got up the next morning, came to church. At the end of the first service, I stepped down and I looked over there and our security guys were waiting for me. And I knew, I knew what they were gonna tell me. It was a long walk. And they came up to me and told me that she had passed away at 840 that morning. I want you to know that the only reason I was here was because she made me come. I would have been with her. So I set things in motion that morning. All this is in the book in great detail. I don't know why I'm telling you all these details, but it helps me if you don't mind. I set things in motion and I brought my staff in. I feel so sorry for them. I still feel sorry for them. I still love you all. And I told them that Rochelle's died. They all cried. We were in the back. I said, I'm going to ask you to do the hardest thing I've ever asked you to do. You've got to go out and do two more services. When it comes to the teaching and all that, they're going to run the tape from the first service. I said, you can't tell anybody. You can't tell your families. You can't tell your spouses. You guys have to just keep quiet until we decide how we're going to handle this, how we're going to release the knowledge of it. And they did it somehow, some way. Incredible people. So I got in my car a little after 1030. I drove up the hill, got on the freeway. I was listening to some Hillsong praise and worship music in my car. I couldn't call anybody because all my friends are pastors. 
and all of them were in church. <laughs> and the out-of-town guys, the guys that live in foreign countries, were all asleep. <laughs> and uh, all of them told me later, you should have called me anyway. Yeah, I should have. But really, I think I needed a few moments. I knew I had about 20 to 25 minutes to myself from here to the west side where I lived. And I realized as I was just on the freeway that life as I had known it and planned it was over. All of my plans were connected to her. Does that make sense to you? It was us. It wasn't me, it was us. It was Rochelle and Charles. It was never Charles and Rochelle. It was always Rochelle and Charles. <laughs> You know, for being five foot two, she really was a force. I mean, five feet, she really was a force. And those of you that knew her would say amen to that, and force would be in all caps. And, uh, and I knew at that moment that I was not prepared. Now, here it comes. I was not prepared for this moment. We'd never discussed it. We'd never talked about anything other. The last sentence Rochelle said to me on Saturday night was, I'm going to get better. There's a scripture in Hebrews, the 11th chapter, that says that people die in faith. Rochelle died in faith. The best way. So I prayed a prayer. You heard me talk about it on the video. And the prayer was, and I quote, Father, I can't screw this up. Help me. Looking back 10 years, I realized that there was something in that prayer that was going to become a great force in my life. And I share it with you if you have had a body shot, if you have gone through some of the things or in the, or you know somebody, one of the things looking back now that I realized in praying that prayer was my commitment to the people connected to me. I can't screw this up. This was my life, my children's lives, my grandchildren's lives, and this phenomenal church that God has graced me to be a part of and to pastor. I could not, I could not screw all that up and I needed God's help. And that commitment, listen, listen, I'm doing this to help you. Your commitment to the people you're connected to will give you strength to get up and go forward. I'm gonna say that to you again. Your commitment to what you are supposed to be and the blessing that you are supposed to be to the people you are connected to and will be connected to, if you recognize that commitment and you embrace it, it will give you the strength to get up and go forward. I, would, I know some of you will say, wow, how did you get that? I'll tell you how I get it. It's a simple verse. I didn't realize it at the time that, you know, the Bible does things in you that when you see it, you don't know it's doing in you until you look back and you see that it did things you didn't know. Don't ask me to repeat that. I don't think I could. <laughs> but the reality is, is that there's a promise and it's a big deal to me. It's a big deal in our church. It's one of our pillars of who we are. God said, as for me, I will bless you and you will be a blessing. And that scripture had lived in me for so long and transformed my thinking and my approach to life so much that I could not, could not screw this up. I couldn't fail. My children, my grandchildren, all of you, my friends, and people I didn't even know yet. And most of all, I couldn't fail him. I couldn't screw this up. My choice and your choice has effect on other people. Deuteronomy 30 verse 19 says, 
I said before you, life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you, read it with me, and your seed may live. I think accepting that responsibility also gives you a great privilege. The responsibility that my choices matter not only to me, but to everyone connected to me. What a responsibility, but what a privilege. Can I hear a good amen tonight? without thinking about it that morning, I made a positive move in my life. Hear me now. To search the word and seek the Lord for answers for my life. Let me say that to you again. I made a positive move that morning and every morning since then to search the word And seek the Lord for answers. I knew that I would not find recovery in the bottom of a wine bottle. In my darkness, which I've told you about, in my fear, my grief, my regret, my guilt, I decided this was not the abundant life Jesus came to give me. I stand before you tonight thanking God for this book. Now, there will be some that will laugh at me and mock me for that, and some on social media, say whatever you want, Bubba. You haven't lived where I've lived. You haven't seen what I've seen. You haven't experienced what I've experienced. You can but you haven't. You mock us because you don't know. That's okay. Your mocking does not change what I know. Your mocking does not change what we have experienced. And that you can build your life on this book. And not only can you, you must. Because in Matthew 7, Jesus said that life brings storms. Did somebody say amen to that? Life brings storms. Bring storms, and you want to build your house on the rock, which is hearing and doing the word. Hearing and doing the word. Hearing and doing the word. You build your house on the rock, and if you don't, if you hear the word and don't do it, you build your house on the sand. And sand foundation is okay till you get a storm. I thank God that 40 years before I had this encounter in my life, I was taught to do that. God brought teachers into our lives that taught us the authority and the power of the Word. That we hear the voice of God when we hear the Word. The psalmist said, the angels hearken to the voice of the Word. So the Word has voice. And it speaks to us. It's amazing to me how many people I see around today on Christian media and Christian television and Christian this and that, that, that kind of have put that aside. And it's all, well, I got to go somewhere. I got to hear. God, you got to speak to me. He's speaking to you. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to help somebody now. He's speaking to you. I would not be standing here tonight, the man that I am and the man that I'm going to become, without that word. It is the word. For in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. It's the word. So I made a positive move to search the word and seek the Lord for answers. And in my darkness, my fear, my grief, my regret, my guilt... I decided, John 10, 10, this is not abundant life. And I'm going to go get my abundant life. 
And out of it came some thoughts that I'll give you quickly that, that popped up. I spend a lot of time talking about in the book. And one of them was, uh, the Lord led me to John the 11th chapter. We sung a song about it tonight. In John the 11th chapter, it's the story of Jesus with Lazarus. Just a couple more minutes, okay? Everybody okay? Amen. Story of Jesus with Lazarus. And there's an interesting trend situation that takes place there, right? And in verse 33, he said, Jesus therefore saw her weeping, the Jews also weeping with her. He groaned in his spirit and was troubled, or it says he troubled himself. Now, it's not troubled, there's not a bad word, it's a good word, meaning he stirred himself up. But notice here, it says he groaned in the spirit, right? And then further down, I think it's in verse 35, 30, anyway, it says Jesus wept, I think it's 36. So he groaned within himself, and then he wept. And then in verse 38, it says he groaned within himself again. So he groaned, he wept, and he groaned. And I saw that, and I was like, well, what is, what is that? He groaned, and then he wept, and then he groaned. And... So I look, you know, those of you come to church, you know me, I got to look up words, right? And I looked up the word groaned and it said he became indignant. So he became indignant and then his humanity came and he wept, but he didn't stay in the weeping Jesus, he came back. And it wasn't the weeping that raised Lazarus from the dead. It was the indignation that raised Lazarus from the dead. You catch what I'm saying to you? Nothing wrong with weeping. Jesus wept. I wept. David wept. <laughs> Jeremiah was called the weeping prophet. And he's got a book in the Bible with his name on it. So I continued, and, and, the, and the word groaned also means Jesus roared. He roared in his spirit. Because the next verse said, and with a loud voice, he said, Lazarus, come forth. And you know, there's preachers, preachers being preachers. I heard one preacher say one time, do you know why he called his name Lazarus? Because if he hadn't, everybody in the cemetery would have been coming up. <laughs> I don't know if that's true or not, but sounds good. Preach is good. That's either Tommy Barnett or Pastor T.D. Jakes have come up with that. This is one of those two guys. And, uh, so he raised him. And I remember that night, I lay there, and I was, I was, I'd been in bed, and I couldn't sleep, and I got up, and I just felt like I needed to read this chapter like I'd never read it. It was about 3 o'clock in the morning. I hadn't slept in a long time. But let me tell you something. Always understand this. Nobody said this to me, and I found it out, and that's why I put, wrote the book, and why I'm talking to you tonight that no matter how dark you may be, how dark the darkness is in your life, your light is coming. Yeah. And the scripture says, it is the entrance of his word that brings that light. And so I looked at that and I realized I needed to get my roar back. And that roar comes from your indignation. I became indignant. In West Texas, we would call it something else, but we're a church tonight. And <laughs> how many of you know what two words I'm thinking of? And I became those two words. It was slow. And you can do the same. You got to get mad at the injustice of what's happened to you. It's okay to get mad. Listen, it's okay to get mad at your enemies. It's okay. Nothing wrong with it. Some of you need to get your, your, your roar back. The next thing I remember the Lord teaching me was out of Paul's life, 
And I began to look at everything that Paul went through. He was beaten, robbed, shipwrecked, beaten again with rods. Three times he was beaten with rods. Can you imagine? They stoned him one time until he died. He died. They beat him multiple times with whips. He was shipwrecked, left in the ocean. His friends betrayed him. People that told him, told him that they were believers, betrayed him, robbed him. He spent an entire winter one time without proper clothing, freezing. He had to write a letter to a guy and ask him to bring him his coat. The Apostle Paul. And I looked at this list and I noticed something. I was reading it one day and I looked at it and I noticed there was one thing that was left out. He listed all these things he went through and there's one thing he never said, why me? Why me? Why me? He never said that. And I, made, I realized, and I made this simple statement, I'm not the first man that lost his wife and I won't be the last. The universe did not align against me. I'm going to quit thinking, why me? It doesn't matter because when you ask why me, listen, I'm trying to help you tonight. When you ask why me, you know what you're doing? You're staying in the past. There's no life in the past. That's why they call it past. It's gone. There's no life in it. Life is in the now and in the future. And so I, I began to think that way, right? Then, of course, in John 11 chapter, you saw it on the video tonight. I won't spend much time on it. I then began to allow Jesus to be my stand-up and my recovery. And because he is my stand-up and my recovery, I can choose to be recovered just like David did. Amen. I can choose to be recovered. I remember the night when that came alive in me. Again, I was in my bedroom and I moved my study materials upstairs and and because uh, I would, like I said, I'd be up <laughs> all hours. And so I just felt the Lord bring me back to John 11 and I read that, I am the resurrection and I read that. And you know what? He wants to be your stand up in recovery too. And it became so alive to me. I literally came out of bed and I was standing in my bedroom and I lifted my hands towards heaven. And I heard Jesus speak to me in my heart and he said, you can't. You can't get up on your own. Let me stand up. Listen, and because I'm in you, when I stand up, you will stand up too. And listen, what he did for me, he'll do for you. I don't care what knocks you to the ground. I don't care who knocked you to the ground. I don't care how long you've been on the ground. I don't care, ma'am, I don't care, sir how hard you've tried to get up, you can get up tonight because the stand-up lives in you. And I'm not being cute, I'm not being preacher, I'm not being funny. There ain't nothing been dealt that he can't stand up from it. He can get up from it. And he got me up. I remember seeing it in my heart. I can see it as if it happened right now. I can see him And then I began to move towards recovery. Because he is, I choose to be. Does that make sense to you? And then the last thing I'll share with you tonight. I discovered in my life and, and in talking to other people that as a species, we are not good with endings. We're really good with beginnings. Right? We love beginnings. Right? Baby's born. Woohoo! Everybody's shouting. Everybody's hollering. It's great. It's wonderful. Right? Great. Oh, you're starting first grade. <laughs> right? We could go on and on. We love beginnings. 
We're good with beginnings. We're opening the new company. We got the ribbon. We got the big silly scissors, right? We got all of that. We got the groundbreaking. It's all exciting. It's beautiful. We're really good with beginnings, but we don't know what to do with endings. And endings are part of life. Right? I... I Remembered all the stuff, the first date I went on with Rochelle, the first time we kissed, which was on the first date, and <laughs> my mama didn't raise no fool, right? <laughs> and, uh, you know, I mean, the, when we first told people, well, I could go on and on and on, and then I'm going to get sentimental, I'm going to start crying, and we're not going to get out until 11, all right? <laughs> And uh, so I, re I remember all the, I remember when we got married. I remember when Shannon was born, when Jared was born. I remember when, when they got married, when we had our first grandkids, and when we started the church, and we, we had our first service with 100, and our first service with 500, and our first service with 1,000. I remember all that. I remember when we built that building next door, when we built this building, which everybody said, you can't do that in El Paso. Well, just stand back. Watch. Now, if you've never heard me before, I'm going to take about 30 seconds. I'm going to give my little speech that I've been giving for years. And my little speech is this. We don't got to live in Dallas to do great things. You can do great things right here. You don't got to live in Houston to do great things. You can do great things right here. You don't got to live, you don't got to live in San Antonio or Austin. You know what somebody told me the other day? Do you know what somebody told me the other day? Somebody came up to me the other day and said, well, you know, pastor, this isn't Lubbock, you know. Lubbock? <laughs> Lubbock. It used to be Dallas and Houston and San Antonio. Now it's Lubbock. Now we're... Nothing against the fine people of Lubbock. <laughs> There's a scripture in John 19, chapter, verse 30. Jesus is on the cross. Listen to it. John 19, verse 30. And it says that Jesus said, It is finished. And I looked at that one day and I went, wait a minute. He said, it is finished. The truth is, the disciples thought he was finished. He was just getting started. Yeah. Now hear me. It may be finished in your life. It, a relationship, maybe you had a dream job that ended, maybe you something. It, does that make sense to you? It is finished. But the end of an era is not the end of your destiny. The end of a relationship is not the end of your life. It may end. You're not done. Separate the it from you. Does that help you? I separated the it. It ended. My time with Rochelle ended. It ended. But I wasn't done. The devil will try to tell you that when you have an ending, you're done. What endings do, listen to this verse. This verse knocked me over. Ecclesiastes 7, verse 8. Better is the end of a thing than the beginning. What? What? Look at verse 10. He ties it back in. Say not thou, what is the cause that the former days were better than these? For you do not inquire wisely concerning this or if you think that way. You're not speaking with wisdom. Let me tell you what the issue is. A couple more minutes. Jesus explained it to us in Luke the 8th chapter. You know what our issue is? We love the old. In Luke, the eighth chapter, Jesus said, you got to get new wine for your new wine skins. Look at that. With every ending, God 
has a new beginning for you. But our problem is, as a species, we like the old. With the, we, Jesus said, you, don't, you know what your issue is? Say, you say, the old is better. But the old is over. So the end of a thing can in truth give you a new beginning. Because Jesus is ending in beginnings. Now where did I get that? Where did I come up? Well, when it says it, in the book of Revelation, Jesus is Alpha and Omega, beginnings and endings. Well, if he's beginnings and endings, then he's also endings and beginnings. If he's o Alpha, then he's Omega. And if he's Omega, then he's Alpha, right? Because he is both simultaneously. He's not one and then the other later. He is both at the same time. So in every ending, he is standing there ready to give you a new beginning. Did you hear that? There's a new beginning for you. There's a new beginning for you. And so... One day he spoke to me. I'm almost done. He spoke to me in Genesis, and he said to me, I want you to read Genesis 1 like you've never read it. I went, okay. So I went to Genesis 1, and I saw something, right? Verse 5. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. Next. And God called the firm in heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. And you know the story, right? And the evening and the morning were the third day. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. And the sixth day and the seventh day. The evening and the morning. And I looked at that. And for the first time in my life, I went, what? We don't, that's not how we think of days. We think of days as evening, I mean, as morning to evening. Now, does God know that? Of course God knows that. Then why did he do that? Why did he call a day evening morning. There's only one reason that makes sense. Because he wants us to always know that God is always moving our lives from darkness to light. 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 light. And I'm telling you tonight, no matter what kind of darkness you may be in, and I explain it to you in great detail in the book, God is moving you from darkness to light. I don't care how hard winter holds on. Spring is coming. I don't care how dark it is. As soon as that sun breaks the horizon, light is here and darkness leaves. You are constantly moving in your life. So you may be in here tonight hurting and grieving and darkness is in your life. You may be hurting over some abuse or some lie or some betrayal or some loss in your life. And I'm glad to bring you the good news of the Bible tonight and tell you, your light is coming. And it is bringing you a new beginning. Let Jesus be Lord of your ending that he may bring you a new beginning. Amen.